I thought I would talk about, uh, just address uh, four questions occasioned by China's rise. And just a preview at the outset. One is what are the leadership priorities? Uh, two is, is China revisionist power? Uh, three, what are its goals in the South China Sea? And four, what should be the US policy framework? And I'll cover these all in the few minutes I have, um, more or less uh, in outline form, because any one of these is a, a three-hour presentation, which I don't plan today. OK, first, the priorities of the Chinese leadership. I mean, Xi Jinping has spoken of achieving the Chinese dream, which seems to me a renaissance of, um, of China, a nation that is prosperous, whose citizens live well, that is strong and respected internationally. It's pretty much the aim of Chinese reformers from the Qing Dynasty, from the middle of the 19th century. Uh, I, don't, I don't see uh, actually enormously great difference in content from that uh, historic mantra. The two principal components of it, number one is, or the two principal requirements to achieve it, I think in Xi's, in Xi's mind, the number one, domestic stability. Uh, that has involved the tightening of political space, as you heard from the previous channel, the repression of dissent, uh, condemnation of Western constitutionalism, they're all part of it. Uh, this is obviously all self-serving for the party leaders who uh, are pursuing such a program. At the same time, in a nation of 1.3 billion, stability is always going to be a priority uh, for any leadership. So uh, it's hard to sit, figure out where the self-serving ends and where the, uh, the actual um, good of the nation picks up. The anti-corruption campaign also is part of this. Uh, although it has some different objectives as well. The second component is uh, economic reform and transformation. Uh, as, uh, as the earlier panel with Nick Lardy talked about, from an industry investment export-driven growth model to higher levels of consumption service-based economy. Um, I won't review the earlier panel's assessment of how well they're doing in that respect, but um, uh, it, clearly it's a mixed record. Uh, in foreign policy, I think she still wants a peaceful environment, or at least not an environment uh, with conflict in the region. But he's much more driven by nationalism, more determined to play a larger international role uh, than his predecessor, and more risk tolerant. Uh, illustrations of this, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, One Belt, One Road. Uh, the policy in the South China Sea and in the Senkaku Diary Islands. I think she genuinely wants a stable relationship with the US, but on the basis of, its, of China's greater influence, principally in the Asia Pacific. I guess the last point they make about the priorities of China's leadership, it seems to me that Xi's domestic challenge is this. When, whenever there is unease over domestic stability and a difficult socioeconomic agenda in China historically over the last 60 years. The fallback of the party generally has been repression and reliance on security services. And that has been the case under Xi Jinping. But a true transformation, which is what Xi talked about at the beginning, and that Deng Xiaoping and Zhu Rongji each brought about, is going to require a different approach than simply relying on the repressive uh, capabilities of the security agencies. It's going to require, as under Deng and Zhu, a China that's open to the West and to the U.S., to innovation, to civil society and dissenting ideas, although the record under Deng and Zhu was more mixed than that, and it allows more space domestically. So the question is, will she take a different approach, particularly in the second term, or to what, if what we've seen is what we're going to get. And uh, I think we all have our hunches. Uh, I don't have a definitive answer, but um, that, to me, is the question. Secondly, is China, a, under Xi, a revisionist power? Xi certainly wants a global system that better reflects China's views and its influence. The system was created by others, primarily by the US. The PRC had no role in creating it, and that is not satisfactory to Xi or to any Chinese leader. 
Uh, that said, China has been a principal, if not the principal, beneficiary of the system. And its spokesmen and its leaders frequently say they want to strengthen it, not damage it. Uh, in my view, the evidence of China as a global revisionist power uh, is simply not there uh, at the moment, at this stage. China has joined and supported the key global institutions and most norms, in particular nonproliferation, counterterrorism, respect for sovereignty, and the UN Charter, climate change. It's made major contributions, obviously, to global growth and trade played a major role in the P5 plus one negotiations on the Iran nuclear program. It's provided support on the North Korea UN Security Council resolution. The two or three global norms that China, where China is not in conformity, of particular concern, I think, are these. Number one, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, that is more of a regional issue than a global issue in terms of China's approach. I don't see that China is seeking to overturn the norms of uh, unclose outside of the South China Sea. Um, I'll say more on that later, so I'll move on from that at this stage. Uh, number two, human rights. Um, goes without saying that China is not and has not been since 1949 in conformity with international standards on human rights. Uh, frankly, our influence on this issue as a government is negligible. And I say this as someone who spent uh, a good deal of my career working on human rights issues with the Chinese or against the Chinese. What I think the most important things we can do are, number one, to live up to our values and to make our system what it should be. That is frankly more effective than uh, hectoring others. Uh, and the changes we've seen in China over the last 40 or 50 years have to do with the example, uh, substantially, of the United States, of Taiwan, of Hong Kong. Um, and to the extent, and the U.S. system, uh, those of you who have been overseas lately know that at the current moment, admiration is not high, uh, particularly in this presidential campaign. Um, you encounter it anywhere you go in Asia. And so, uh, an increased volume by American officials on the subject of human rights at a time when our own image on the subject is, uh, let's say, tarnished, uh, is not likely to lead to good results. But, but here's the distinction I'd make. There's been Chinese behavior uh, on human rights that goes beyond China's borders uh, lately, that touches on international issues and touches on uh, bilateral issues things like abductions of Chinese and other nationals in Hong Kong or in Thailand, uh, blocking websites of I have a, a long list of, uh, I, was just, I just stayed at the Grand Hyatt Hotel and they had next to, the com next to the computer there was a list of don't sign on to the following eight websites because they're blocked by the Chinese government um, and had companies that you're all familiar with. Uh, I put this in my pocket and I uh, met that morning with an official whom I will not name, but let's just say he is at the top of the hierarchy on cyberspace issues. Uh, and at the beginning of the meeting, I handed him this piece of paper. And I said, what's the story here? Uh, and um, his answer, the gist of his answer was, why is the Grand Hyatt doing this? Uh, they're just inciting people to use VPNs and to find ways around, uh, around the blocks. Anyway, uh, so that to me touches on international. Uh, international issues and is a, a, an entirely legitimate and proper issue for us to press the Chinese on. Uh, the recent regulation that purports to block Western content, uh, foreign content on websites, very troubling. Um, constraints on the uh, operation of foreign non-governmental organizations in China, deep constraints. Uh, blocking of visas for American scholars uh, who don't say, who say things that the Chinese leadership doesn't like. Um, harassment of journalists. There's a whole slew of such kinds of behavior where, I mean, having done dialogue with the Chinese forever where you make your points and they say, fine, thank you very much, none of your business, you know, move on. These are our business. All these are our business. Uh, and um, 
not only is it legitimate for us to raise these, but I think it's legitimate for us to think about exacting a cost if China does not address them. Uh, and the third area where China's behavior uh, is not, I think, in conformity with international norms, this is a little more of a mixed picture, is the cyber area uh, internationally. And I think the jury is still out on that. I think it's very good that the administration negotiated an agreement with the Chinese on cyber theft of intellectual property last September. From what I'm hearing from people in the administration, uh, there has been a change in Chinese behavior. Uh, uh, that there are still some things going on, but it's not of the same magnitude. It's not clear that it's essentially directed. So I think the jury is still out on that one. Uh, but there, China does have an interest in global cyber norms. I mean, they don't want to be hacked. They don't want to be sabotaged. They want to remain uh, a place for possible innovation. And if they take themselves off the map uh, on cyber, that won't happen. Um, as I, I said, I don't think China is a revisionist power globally. I think it's a different proposition in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, China clearly seeks a revision of the current order in the region. I, I personally think it goes a little bit too far to say that China seeks to dominate the region. Uh, that you know, the Americans can't seem to make a judgment. You're, you know, the, they're either supine or they're do seeking dominance. I think it's hard to know uh, exactly what the uh, limits that China is seeking. Let's just say they're seeking more influence. Um, and they're seeking ways of countering the US military historic preeminence or dominance in the region. Uh, and they're wary of the US alliance system, and they're looking for ways to counter it or perhaps weaken it. Uh, third, what are the Chinese goals in the South China Sea? Um, I think it's unfortunate that this, the South China Sea issue has become the driver of US-China relations um, and of China's relations with its neighbors. Uh, for those of us who have been dealing with China for 40 years, who would have thought, you know, these stupid rocks and shoals and, uh, in the middle of the ocean? Uh, I look, look up Wikipedia about uh, uh, South China Sea. The first sentence in there is, the South China Sea has no indigenous, the South China Sea has sea turtles and birds, but no other indigenous population, okay? That's the first sentence. And that this should be uh, a, the cockpit of uh, strategic and re regional rivalry is really quite extraordinary. Why is China doing this? Uh, number one, I think that they are seeking to extend their military perimeter. They would say defensively. It's hard to separate offense from defense and um, hard to know where one picks up and the other leaves off. Uh, they are seeking to challenge longstanding US Navy preeminence uh, in the region. Uh, in particular, I think they're concerned about the egress from Hainan Islands, where they have a submarine base. Um, and they don't like it being surveilled. Um, they're looking for a basis for a stronger position to assert their sovereignty claims, both in the South China Sea and vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. They, um, the good news, and there's not an awful lot of good news in the South China Sea, is that they haven't used force yet to take down anyone's occupied islands since the Paracels in 1974 at the tail end of the Vietnam War. Uh, but there has been some expulsion of uh, Filipino uh, vessels from reefs and shoals and intimidation of the Philippines. And I think that the current China-Philippine standoff is the most, uh, uh, most alarming aspect of the South China Sea situation right now. And I'm happy to say more about that in the Q&A. And last, I don't want to take up too much time, what should be the framework of US policy? Um, I just did a paper on it, and um, you can find it on the Brookings website. I basically contrast two opposing um, approaches, one you might call accommodation, and the other you might call untrammeled rivalry. And um, what would each look like? Accommodation basically uh, is advocated by people who think that the US is going to have to uh, accept uh, this rising curve of Chinese power, um, that uh, the end of U.S. dominance, which is a term that international relations theorists like to use, which I don't much like, frankly, uh, in the region uh, isn't come to an end, and therefore we should accommodate by adjustments in our Taiwan policy, ending arms sales, weakening or not relying so much on the defense uh, uh, alliances, and drawing back from our extensive military presence in the region. Um, the untrammeled rivalry 
approach judges that China does seek regional dominance, uh, that we should double down. Uh, we should undertake a military buildup in response. Uh, we should have a militarized response in the South China Sea and treat the relationship as zero sum. Um, as an old State Department person, I, you know, I'm used to memos that they had three options. Option A is nuclear war, option B is surrender, and option C is a sensible uh, diplomatic uh, uh, solution. And um, I'm an option C guy, um, <laughs> but it, just because it lacks the clarity of options A and B doesn't mean it's wrong. I mean, that's, it's in fact right. Um, I think a and, B, a and B do not fully serve U.S. interests. China is our number one trading partner, or it's on the way to becoming that. We have growing investment links. You all know the science and technology, the academic uh, uh, interchanges, the cooperation on strategic issues, which are essential. Uh, we can't accomplish our global objectives without it. And Asia is, frankly, a pretty stable, prosperous, and dynamic place compared to the rest of the world. Look at the rest of the world. My God, look at the Middle East, the greater Middle East, Africa, Latin America. Um, it's not in the U.S. interest to see Asia disrupted, and we shouldn't be a party to that if we can avoid it. The countries in the region want the U.S. to be present and assertive. They don't want U.S.-China confrontation in which they have to choose sides. So I guess my bottom line is we should accept the idea of China's growing global influence. It's a reality, and it should be supportive of global systems, but we need to maintain a strong regional political, economic, and security presence. Last word, if I have a minute, on the South China Sea, just very briefly, what do I think we should do, just in outline form. I think there are, there are three things. Number one, I think we may have to maintain our presence, our security presence, our military presence, and operations in the region. And we have to build security relations with others if China seeks to militarize the region and build out its military presence. And that's what the administration has been doing, frankly, and I can give you a dozen examples. Uh, and it's, we're going to have to do more of it uh, because we're not going to get anywhere without deterrence. You can't simply recite principles. There's got to be some deterrence there. Uh, number two, we should strongly encourage a code of conduct between China and the other claimants. Uh, they've agreed in principle that there should be one, but the Chinese are slow walking that. And they're in no hurry. Uh, and number three, I think we should take up Xi Jinping on his statement last September when he visited the U.S. in the Rose Garden that China does not seek to militarize the uh, Spratly Islands. And we should undertake a discussion, ultimately, a negotiation if possible, um, bilaterally, multilaterally. And what does that mean? What does it mean not to militarize the South China Sea? Thank you all very much. Look forward to your questions.